Hi, um, these are my um, online uh, notes to complement the notes I've given so then we can free up more time for doing examples in class. I'm going to start uh, this one by briefly going through the notes on magnetic energy. What I'm going to do is just consider a case where we only have an inductor and an external source of energy, uh, EMF, in this case a battery. But what we'll be trying to show is uh, if we only have that circuit, so there's no resistor, um, then uh, what we can view it as uh, our, we will show that energy is stored in the inductor which is going to be equal to the uh, source of EMF. And so that's why we've um, uh, shown that we can relate our external EMF with our uh, expression for inductance. And if we look at this expression, what we can view it as is our EMF uh, describes uh, the force per unit charge uh, required to uh, drive a, a, a charge around a circuit or a loop. Um, it's related to the change in the velocity associated with those charge carriers and it has uh, a geometric term that relates essentially the inertia of the system. Now uh, we can then directly compare that to uh, Newton's second law where we have a force per mass we could view as um, uh, then we have a change in, uh, which is proportional to the change of velocity of that mass with time and um, a, a, a coefficient of inertia, in this case mass. So we could view it as our inductor is a coefficient of magnetic inertia. And if we were to integrate um, these expressions then we could determine uh, what our um, energy is. So in the case of Newton's I apologize. In the case of Newton's second law, our kinetic energy would be half mv squared. Likewise, by analogy, we'd expect our magnetic energy to be half our inductor I squared. So let's do this a little more rigorously. Um, we know that power is equal to our current times our EMF, uh, IV, and so what we could do is consider that the, the power is a derivative of work done with time. Uh, we can use our expression for inductance, and then we just need to integrate this to determine the amount of work done. And here we've shown the integration. We would go from zero to our stable current I, and we integrate as a derivative of i to get our total uh, work done and we'd find that our total work done would be equal and opposite to the energy stored. And so the energy stored in our system uh, would be half i squared at, at our inductance. So it does seem to work in terms of our analogy. But what about a case where we have a pair of inductors? Well, in that case, then, we need to consider our mutual inductance, which we learned from our lecture on Tuesday. So we have, uh, we would expect that there would be um, uh, stored energy from uh, related to the self-inductance and the current of coil 1. Uh, similar case for coil 2, and then an extra term associated with the mutual inductance. So we're going to discuss that. So at time equals zero, we can imagine our two coils, which are nearby, um, to have no current. And I'm just going to turn on the current in coil number one. And we already discussed that in the previous section, and we end up with a case that there'll be um, an induced EMF due to the self-inductance of that coil, and that would result in stored energy from the external source of EMF that's forming this current. Uh, we'd get stored energy in our inductor or our coil um, which would be half Li uh, associated with the current of the coil 1. So there would be work done to store energy in our coil. 
then afterwards we turn on after um, that we would consider the case where our current in the second coil is turned on too. By symmetry we'd also expect there to be uh, energy stored from our um, second um, inductor which would be stored in the coil but we would also have to consider an additional power term due to current number one um, and uh, that would affect coil number two and so what we could do is include the EMF associated with the mutual inductance uh, multiplied by the current of coil one and integrate it to determine the work done and so that's what we show is um, the stored energy would then be the mutual inductance um, between the two currents and that is why we obtained the expression above before continuing it's worth noting a distinction between a resistor and an inductor for an in resistor or we can use the same uh, expression power is related to our uh, e source of external source of EMF and our, uh, or the voltage drop associated with our resistor times our current and so energy flows into a resistor and then this is dissipated in the form of heat and this is regardless if current is steady or time dependent this is not a case for an inductor for an inductor energy flows into an inductor only if our current is increasing with time and what happens is our energy uh, is stored um, when we change uh, the derivative such that our current decreases with time energy is then released and then if we have a steady case there's no energy we will discuss that in turn by um, considering LRC circuits where we have an inductor, a resistor and a capacitor and what we'll show is the capacitor uh, stores energy in a different way to the inductor whereas the resistor d d dissipates the energy and we can get um, oscillating circuits um, with which we'll discuss much later for now I'm going to return back to our stored magnetic energy in our solenoid and consider only one solenoid in that case we only have to consider about the self-inductance we have an expression for self-inductance that we determined in our class previously um, and here we have our expression so what we can do is remember that our magnetic field um, on in our solenoid if we assume that this is an infinitely long perfect description of a solenoid is given uh, by um, re relates to the number of coils per unit length and the current so we can substitute uh, our current for our magnetic field so then we get rearrange our, our expression uh, that we had previously and we obtain um, a thing, an area a volume term of our solenoid that's our pi r squared l and outside we have a, a b squared over 2 mu naught now in our so perfect solenoid we're assuming that the b field is uniform uh, what we could do is generalize this expression this is what we've tried to show, show here where I apologize we've viewed it as in a more general expression of this equation we would have 1 over 2 mu naught and then the integral of b by itself um, over our enclosed volume so we can imagine that our b squared over 2 mu naught refers to uh, magnetic energy density and in our solenoid that's uniform but it doesn't necessarily have to be uniform and so this term here is our general expression that we've uh, come to from a specific case the nice thing about this general expression 
is that we can have a direct analogy with what we've learned from electrostatics where we were able to show uh, last semester that we do get uh, an expression that looks very similar for our electric case. Now what we're going to do next is to move on to trying to derive a general expression uh, a generalized um, proof or, or essentially reassure us with a general description that this equation it does have validity. So instead of our perfect solenoid let's consider a general loop. We can relate our magnetic flux to our self-inductance of our loop um, and then we can remember that we can invoke Stokes's theorem um, and deal in terms of our magnetic A vector rather than our magnetic field. As a result, we can consider a case where we have a loop w which, defines our, uh, which defines our surface um, and we can transform uh, our previous case of our magnetic flux so then we can relate it to our inductance and our current in this equation Li equals the path integral of A dot dl and then we know that our energy, stored energy of that loop should be equal to a half in the inductance multiplied by I squared and that comes from our integral of the, the, wor uh, the work done and so we can rearrange our equation such that we have U equals um, our, is related to our current and our path integral A. The benefit of using the A vector is that we can assign our current to have the same direction as dL which makes sense um, as long as we choose the right direction or else you'll have a negative sign. Uh, following this through then we could uh, change our path integral uh, such that uh, we now have our A vector um, dot, uh, dot product with our current as our path integral and what we can do is transform from considering current to considering our current density which is current over area and that means that we have to change from a path integral to a volume integral and so what we have is our current um, uh, current density uh, dot product with our magne magnetic uh, vector potential so we have a dot j it doesn't matter if we use j dot a or a dot j they're equivalent uh, the benefit of writing it in this form is immediately we see an analogy to the stored energy we had for electrostatics where we could relate our current density with our scalar potential as a volume integral and again uh, our stored magnetic energy relates our magnetic vector potential and our current density within a volume integral. So I'm going to consider um, steady currents and with steady currents I can relate using Ampere's law. I don't need Maxwell's correction which is what we'll come to later. We can assume that the change is um, very small and we can get a case where we can uh, we can substitute our B fill uh, our current density for our B fill so we can uh, put in here our term associated with the current density then we can use a uh, vector ID which is the uh, divergence of uh, two uh, cross product of two vectors can be expanded in this form uh, we note that the curl of A is B so we get B dot B and an extra term which is reassuring because then immediately we can see that we have our uh, uh, volu uh, our averaged magnetic density uh, within our volume we just have to integrate that uh, unfortunately we do have an extra term which we will have to consider so here we've written the um, expression for our total magnetic energy we have our average 
flux within a, a um, volume, and then we have this additional term. And this relates to a uh, surface integral by Sokes' theorem that relates our magnetic vector potential and our magnetic field. What we could do is if we consider an integration over all space, then we can ignore the surface contribution because that becomes vanishingly small and we end up with our expression as we um, predicted from our uh, simple uh, uh, by looking at the general expression for our simple case. It's worth noting that we saw a similar thing um, when we considered electrostatic energy where uh, doing a similar approach you would have had an extra term which relates your uh, scalar potential with your electric field for a surface and what we did was say that if you considered all space your energy uh, following description where our electrostatic energy was given by this term um, here which relates our uh, energy uh, electrostatic uh, fi uh, f electrostatic field our um, electric field um, de energy density over in our volume and likewise we have our magnetic field density over all space we can then consider there to be a magnetic flux density uh, which we could say is um, the dot product of the magnetic field itself over um, some uh, coefficient uh, per unit volume inside our, volu uh, in our, surf our surface integral. In case of our solenoid we found that it was nicely uniform and so this was a constant. It's noting that this would probably not be a constant in other scenarios and so, uh, but this general expression of determining the magnetic field at any small region and um, determining this dot product with itself over a 2 mu naught uh, will give you your magnetic flux density. But one of the first things you learn about magnetic fields is magnetic forces do no work. And this leads to a very important aspect of what we've determined. When we have an inductor, the change of the B field induces an electric field. That electric field can do work. And so that explains how it, we have a magnetic energy, stored energy, and how uh, magnetic forces still do no work, but we are able to um, derive these expressions and them to make physical sense. So what we have is our change of magnetic field inducing electric field that does the work, but we can view it as before it does that, there's stored, e there's stored energy because of the magnetic field.